Um, so at the end of last time, um, we wrote up this theorem of gauge, which tells you how to tell whether a module for an, a finitely generated module for an elementary obedience P group over an algebraic enclosed field of characteristic P, whether whether it's projective. And the first thing I'm going to do today is give you the version for infinitely generated generated modules. And you'll really see the difference in behavior, and it's quite important. Um, so, so this is sort of the first step along the way towards today's goal, which is to get to the Balmer spectrum of the stable module category. So we're, we're really going to find all the layers of the stable module category um, that you can distinguish in a triangulated way. Days. Yeah. This is often actually called Dade's Lemma, but uh, it seems too good to be a lemma. <laughs> um, so if you remember, so K last time was algebraically close, and I'm not going to write that down because we're going to um, not assume it this time. So this is a field of characteristic P. Um, e is an elementary medium P group. So that's just a direct relative R copies of Z mod P. And inside the group algebra of KE, we have these elements X, I, which is GI minus one. Um, uh, one less than root of Y less than root of P, sorry, R. Um, and so the group algebra actually has this description as a truncated polynomial ring in the axis. <clears throat> and so what we do is um, for infinitely generated modules, our M is a KE module. And at this stage, we're not going to assume that M is finitely generated. And what this means is that we're going to have to extend the field to possibly transcendental extensions in order to pick up everything. So let's suppose big K containing little k is a field extension. So what we're going to do is take linear combinations of these elements with coefficients in big K. Uh, so if alpha is in affine space over big K and it's non-zero and it's equal to say lambda one up to lambda r. So those are just the coordinates. We're going to set x alpha equal to lambda 1 x 1 plus double plus lambda r x r. And we're going to ask whether the restriction of m with the field extended up to k, big k, then restricted down to x alpha, whether that's projected. So we look at big K tensed over little k with M restricted down to this algebra. So, and then we ask, is this projective? And the theorem is that if for every field extension and every x alpha defined over that field extension, this is projective, then the module was projective. But you really need infinite extensions of the field. Okay. So, so the theorem is if for all extensions k containing k 
Um, this is projected. Then actually, M is projected. And now you can see why we don't care whether little k is out of really close, for example. Um, and so you may think it's a bit daunting to have to look at all field extensions. You really only need to take a transcendental extension of degree r minus 1 and then algebraically close it. So it suffices to use k algebraically closed of transcendence degree at least r minus 1 over little k. And it's r minus 1 because we're really doing points in projective space somehow rather than that minus space. So the reason why you need these large extensions is you need to have enough generic points. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Oblique. Okay, so... Um, so the next thing to do is to each point defined over this large extension field, I'm going to associate to, for you a prime ideal in the polynomial ring over little k. So let's let's have a polynomial ring. Uh, so let's have k brackets y1 up to yn, yr, is polynomial functions on this affine space. So, so these yi's are dual to the xi's, if you like. So what we do is, um, given a point lambda 1 up to lambda r, this is our non-zero point in affine r space over capital K, Let's define an ideal in this polynomial ring. So I'm going to call it P because it will turn out that it's prime. Uh, this is the thing I was calling alpha, so let's still call it alpha. So P of alpha, I'm going to define to be the set of F in k brackets y1 up to y r such that f of alpha equals zero. Is this a theorem for all for a particular special forward? So for all yeah I should really have said for all k and for all alpha in fi R space over capital K. So you need to check really every extent, every point over these extensions. Okay, so so given a point defined over a big extension field, that defines for me a prime ideal in the polynomial ring over the small field. Okay. It's prime just because. Well, because this is an integral domain, I guess. So, um, so we say that alpha is a generic point for this prime p of alpha. That's that's the definition of a generic point for a prime. So this is sort of. The Zariski vague version of generic points before growth and deep got his hands on everything. <laughs> and the point of that definition is that 
an, an adjunct to this theorem is the following. Um, whether um, yes, whether k tensored over k with m restricted to k x alpha modulo alpha x alpha to the p is projective only depends on p of alpha. Uh, and, and now I should actually say that really I only mean you to take homogeneous polynomials here. Um, so if you if you use all the polynomials, you would get an inhomogeneous idea, and that's not really what we want. So you really want to look at only the homogeneous polynomials um, on which alpha vanishes, and then it would not depend on, if you took a scalar multiple of alpha, it wouldn't change the prime ideal, right? So, so really I'm going to put a subscript homogeneous there. So, and then it really only depends on that homogeneous prime. So, um, so as our rank variety, Instead of a closed homogeneous subvariety of affine space as we had last time, what we're going to have is a set of primes, a set of homogeneous primes. So, so the rank variety of an infinitely generated module is, and I'm going to write it as a curly V to indicate that it's a set of primes. So rank variety for E of M is the collection of p of alpha such that it's not project this this thing is not projected okay this is what's going to give the layers of the stable module category and so So yes, so here are some properties. The first property is, of course, what I said up there, the rank variety. Oh, so this is contained in um, pro projective space, proj of x star, sorry, proj of k of y1 up to yn, yr. It's sort of vanishingly small off the right of the screen here. Um, so V R E of M is empty if and only if M is projected. The second property is the same as we wrote down last time, namely if you take a direct sum you get the union. And if you take the tensor product, you get the intersection. You'll notice that there's something interesting about this latter statement, which is that If you take the tensor product and restrict it, or take the tensor product, extend the coefficients and restrict, you get a different answer than if you restrict first and then, or, or extend the coefficients and restrict first, and then tensor the answers. Because this is not a sub hopf algebra of the group algebra. So the inclusion doesn't respect tensor products. Nonetheless, this still holds. And thirdly, every subset 
of proj of the polynomial ring occurs this way. In other words, given a subset of proj, you can construct a module whose rank variety is exactly that subset. Okay, so in order to go from elementary abelian groups to general finite groups, there's a slight problem with this notion of rank variety, which is, it depends on the basis of the group. If you chose a different basis, you would get a different set of um, linear combinations inside the group algebra. And so if you want to sort of conjugate and include inside a bigger group, you have a slight problem um, about doing things consistently, which is where the notion of pi points comes in. So this was introduced by Friedlander and Petzeva. And so what is a pi point? Well, a pi point is, consists of, you still do the field extension, but then I'm just going to take a flat map. Okay, so K contains K a field extension. Then a pi point of KG G a finite group, so G is a finite group here. Well, the other, the other reason for introducing pi points, by the way, is it really, it becomes very necessary when moving to finite group schemes instead of finite groups. Um, you really can't deal properly with finite group schemes without the language of pi points, as far as I know. So a pi point of KG consists of an extension, this extension field K together with a flat map from K of T modulo T to the P to KG that factors through some elementary abelian P subgroup. So what does flat mean? Flat means that this is, a, is flat as a module over that, but it's equivalent to saying that when you include the, this into the elementary abelian P subgroup algebra, the element T goes into the radical, but not the radical squared. Uh, so it's very easy to check whether a map is flat. So, so for an elementary abelian group, these X alphas are examples of pi points, but there are lots of others. So you could take X alpha plus some stupid thing in the square of the radical, and that actually doesn't change whether the module is projective. So that's really the point of doing it this way, is that you, you stop seeing what's in the square of the radical. So, and, and now, instead of making a prime ideal in this polynomial ring, we're going to make a prime ideal in the group cohomology ring. So, associated to a pi point is a prime ideal 
P sub alpha contained in H star of G little k. Defined as follows. We have it? Alpha is that map, is it the flat map? Alpha, yeah, flat map, alpha. Map of rings. It's a map of k algebras. And um, so it takes the coefficients and the coefficients here and just takes t to something in some elementary abelian subgroup al algebra that's in the radical but isn't in the radical square. That's all it's doing. Okay. So like, like these, these um, x alphas that we had up here. So, how do we define this prime ideal? Well, it's the kernel of some composite map. What are we going to do? We're going to start off with the cohomology ring. We're going to extend the coefficients, which just tenses the cohomology ring with big K. Then we're going to restrict. So this is a map to the cohomology ring of k of t modulo t to the p comma k. This map is really alpha star, if you like. And then what is this ring? Well, if p is 2, it's just a polynomial ring in one variable. And if p is odd, it's a polynomial ring in a variable of degree 2 tensed with an exterior generator in degree 1. So I'm going to mod out that exterior generator in degree 1, and then I've got k of this element b, which is in either degree 1 or 2, depending whether um, p is 2 or not. That cohomology ring is just x over the. Yes, it's just x over this ring of k with k. Okay? So we look at the kernel of that. So, so that's some prime ideal here because this is an integral domain. Okay, how are we doing? Yes. So, for example, if we did what we were doing up here with this x alpha as our t, what would this pr prime ideal p alpha look like? So, in the case of x alpha above, well, there are really two cases. If p is 2, then p alpha is just the prime we've defined above, p of alpha. If p is odd, there's a Frobenius map involved. So, um, so p of alpha is really just Phi upper star of P alpha, where P, P, phi, phi here is the following Frobenius map. So this is a map from, where to where? Uh, it's from the cohomology ring of E. Yes, we're in the case of E, right? To this polynomial ring in the Y's that we started off with. And it sends the element VI to YI to the P. So why is it a P's power here? Well, we really wanted to define this on degree one elements, but we were forced to define this on degree two elements, right? And so the 
What is this degree two element? Well, it's a p-fold massive product of copies of, of the nilpotent degree one element. So you would expect some sort of twist by taking the p to power. Does that make sense? If you don't know what a massive product is, tough, just accept this. <laughs> um, okay, so, so in the pre in the Friedlander Peftova language, um, we have the following theorem, which is that um, first of all, whether um, whether alpha star of k tensored over k with m is projective, this is, I'm just taking my module, extending the coefficients and restricting back along alpha. Whether that is Projective only depends on P alpha. And M is projective if and only if for all alpha, what, sorry, for all P um, in Proj of the cohomology ring, um, the restriction is projective. Uh, I should mention that there are actually enough high points to pick up all prime ideals in the cohomology ring here. Well, apart from, there's one missing. It's the maximum ideal of all positive degree elements. You don't pick that one up. Okay. So if you fix a, fix, fix a problem, can yes. you say anything about perceptible alphas for which that's the problem? Well, it's really, yes, I mean, in the same sort of generic point terms as you had before. So, so really, I mean, any prime has an elementary abelian associated with it by equivalence theorem, and um, your your pi point really has to have well, defrabenius if you are in that situation, that generic point. Is that a, I know that was a convoluted sentence, but did it answer the question? I think you did, and I'll work it out later. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now we define the pi support of M to be the collection of P such that K tensor over little K with M alpha star of it. is not projected. So this is the right thing to do for the general finite group. You, you define the, the pi support just to be a subset of proj of the cohomology ring. So, so this p is, well, this alpha is, a, is an alpha such that p alpha is p. Does that make sense? And then this notion of pi support then just has these properties here. So everything occurs. It's empty if and only if the module's projective. Um, and it behaves well on some of the products. So, so what I want to say is that there are two different notions of support that are related here. There's this 
pi support that's defined in terms of these pi points, which has the great advantage that you can actually calculate with it. And then there's a cohomological support that I'm about to define, which gives you the same answer, but reveals some theoretical properties that are not revealed by the pi points and vice versa. So having the two different points of view gives you two quite complementary sets of properties that are both useful for the complete understanding of support. But this notion of support is exactly what's going to give you the Balmer spectrum and the classification of the localizing subcategories of the infinitely generated modules for the stable module category. So, so let me give you the finitely generated version first and then the infinitely generated version. So um, if n is finitely generated, then this was the, the original context in which the support was defined, the kernelological support. So h star of g comma k is the same, if you remember, as x star k g of k k. And if you, the centering over k with n is exact, so there's an obvious map there to x star kg of m m. If you take the kernel of that map, this is an ideal in h star of gk and defines a closed subset of proj h star of gk. And this is defined to be the support of n. Okay. This is not a good definition of n if, if n is infinitely generated. I should warn you of that. Basically because, well, first of all, n doesn't behave well in the first variable, but, uh, but there are other reasons too. Um, so, so it defines a closed subset by taking all the primes containing yeah, exactly. It's, exactly. In the Zariski topology, all you need to do is name an ideal, and then that gives you a closed subset of just the vanishing set of that ideal. So, the theorem relating these things is that pi support of M is equal to the support of M. Wonderful, lovely theorem. And as I just said, the reason why this is so lovely is that each side gives you quite a different set of properties of the, of the support. So in particular, the pi support of a finitely generated module is a closed subset, which wasn't quite obvious from its definition, although you could probably or squeeze it out of rank variety there. Okay, so what do you do for infinitely generated modules to define a, a support? So we're going to define something that again is going to satisfy this theorem, but it's a bit more complicated to define. Um, and this is where the next thing we need to do Good. Next thing we need to do is introduce the stable module category. So maybe I'm missing something obvious, but why is it called the pi prime? According to Eric Friedlander, it's because pi is the first letter of Julia Peptoderson. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ah, ah, we need to do this, this ritual. For your ring, maybe close the button. Yes. Yes. the like, finite rank variety of the infinite one? Yes. In a straightforward way, or? Yes, it's just, 
Um, for a finitely generated module, the rent variety we introduced in the last lecture, the this rent variety is just the set of the set of all closed to degenerate points contained in that closed set. So, so it's a closed subset in the Zurich topology. Are there any more questions before I move on? Good. Then let's move on. Stable module category. Okay, so if you take the module category, that's just an abelian category, right? And it has a subcategory, little mod of KG is the finitely generated module. Finitely generated is the same as finite dimension. I hope I said that at some stage. Not sure really. Um, so how do we get a stable module category? Uh, oh, I really want the brackets here. Stable module category has the same objects as the module category. So the objects are just KG modules. But we alter the arrows by quotienting out any map that factorizes through some projective model. So the arrows, which we write as POM underlined KG M N, is you take the HOMs and mod out the projective homomorphisms. Which are the homomorphisms which factorize through some projective module. But anything that factorizes through some projective module will factor through the projective cover of N, and it will also factor through the injective hull of M. So you can use one particular projective module if you like. But whereas this is an abelian category, this is not. Instead, it's a triangulated category. So what are the translation of the triangles? Well, the translation um, I'll give it to you in both directions. In one direction, you take some projective module mapping onto M and take its kernel. And Shanuel's lemma tells you that it doesn't matter what projective you take, you'll get isomorphic things in the stable module category. Um, but canonically isomorphic. And so omega is actually a functor on the stable module category, but not on the module category. And then, of course, there's an inverse, which is you would inject M into an injective hull or some injective module and take the co-kernel, which we write as omega inverse to them. So these are actually inverse auto-equivalences of the stable module category. And what about the triangles? Well, these come from the short exact sequences of KG modules. If I have a short exact sequence, say A to B, 
to C to zero, how do I get a connecting map from, say, C to omega of A, or from, sorry, from C to omega inverse of A, or from omega of C to A? Well, I do the following. Let me get this right. I map a projective module onto B and compose with the surjection onto C to get a surjection from B to C. And now I pull back. So what is the pullback? Well, it's a kernel of projective module mapping onto C, so it's really omega of C. But I get a map like that. So I've got, I've got myself a map from omega C to A. Furthermore, I've got a short exact sequence. Zero goes to omega C, goes to the direct sum of these two things. A plus P goes to B to zero. So an A plus P is equivalent to A in the stable module category. So really I've got now a sequence, omega C maps to A goes to B. So I've somehow rotated this triangle. So if I, if I do this, if you dualize that construction, you get um, the sort of right-hand side of extending the triangle. So if, altogether, what do I get? I get sort of maps omega C to A, the B to C, the omega inverse A, the omega inverse B, and so on. So that's unwinding the triangle, if you like. So that's the triangulated structure. And this turns both the big stable module category, the little stable module category is exactly the same, but you use finitely generated modules. So, so the relationship between these is exactly the same as the relationship between those. So this is a, a triangulated subcategory of that category. And the only axiom to watch out for is this octahedral axiom. So what's that about? The octahedral axiom is really the shadow in that stable module category of the second isomorphism theorem for modules. So it just says, Sort of a quotient of quotients is you can cancel. So inside this stable module category, we want to construct some eigenpotent functions. They're actually eigenpotent modules and functions. Okay, so, so given a specialization closed, and I'll explain what that means. Subset of proj of the cohomology ring. I.e. It just, it's just closed undergoing to subsets. So V is contained in W, and W is an element of proj. Uh, sorry, it is an element of, I better give this a name, it's curly V. That implies that V is in V. Uh, Oh yes, because it's it's ideals and not varieties. Thank you. Yes. I always I always get things backwards because I think in terms of varieties. Uh, yeah. So in particular it's the wrong in the notes. <laughs> Good, okay. Um, given such a thing, there is a triangle. A distinguished triangle in the big stable module category, uh, which is, um, oh, and a module M.
there is a triangle in the stable module category, gamma sub b of m to m to l sub b of m, where the following two things happen. So gamma sub b of m is a filtered co-limit of finitely generated modules n with the support of n contained in v. Okay, so, so gamma v of m is built out of things supported in v. And so that's the first property. The second property is that um, if the support of n is in v, then there are no maps from n into LV of n. In other words, LV of m is, is v local. Unfortunately, the use of the L's is the opposite in Agnes's talk and mine. Equals zero. Thank you. Yeah. Am I right in thinking the L's are opposite to your talk and mine? I think so. Which ones are local? So LV of M has no maps from anything in anything supported in V. And the other property is that there's a unique triangle of isomorphism determined by these properties. So this defines actually gamma V and LV as functors, it turns out. And so these are what we're going to use to define the support of a, an infinitely generated model. Uh, I may even be able to state the theorem. It's really good. <laughs> So this, is, this is really the usual bout of localization in this triangulated category. So, where are we? Yeah. So, somehow this defines functors for specialization closed subsets. What we really want to do is define it for one element subsets. So, what we do is we choose two specialization closed subsets which just differ in one element and apply a gamma for one of them and an L for the other and compose them. They do commute. So, so given P, and so this is just some prime ideal in the cohomology ring, choose subset, uh, specialization closed subsets Uh, how have I written them? Yes. 
V and W such that P is not an element of V and W is just V union P. Okay, you can always do that. So, I mean, the way to think of this is you've got W here and you've got V here and you've got this is your prime. Thank you. I think that is due to heavy. <laughs> Um, so, what, what you do is you define gamma sub p of your module to be gamma sub w of the module, well, gamma sub w of L sub v of the module, which is the same as L sub v of gamma sub w of the module. Did I get that the right way around? And then the theorem is that this is independent of choice of V and W, given, given a P. Okay. So then, the support of an infinitely generated module is the set of P such that gamma sub P of M being non-zero is the same as being non-projective in the module category. And then, so this has the property, this is the big theorem, the support of M is equal to the pi support of M. So you've got a cohomological way of computing and a pi point way of computing. And they're really so different that you get different things out of them all the time. And this is for general modules M, not just by the generator. This is for all modules M. Yes. Okay, so now I can tell you the theorem. Does everyone here know what a thick subcategory is? You're all nodding. Good. Okay. The thick subcategories of the small stable module category are in bijection. Sorry, ideal. Uh, yes, tensor ideal. I should say that so tensor ideal just means that if I start with something in the thick subcategory and tensor it with anything, I stay in the thick subcategory. So for a finite p group, this is automatic. But for a general finite group, you only need to bother about tensoring with symbols. So if you check that it's closed on the tensoring with each simple, you have your tensor ideal. Or in bijection with the specialization closed subsets of proj h star and gk via either support or pi support. So that describes completely the, the uh, Balmer spectrum. It says that the Balmer spectrum is really proj of h star of g comma k. And if you remember in the first lecture, we described explicitly what spec of h star of g k looks like. So now you just projectivize, and that's the Balmer spectrum. Sorry, are these maps also going to be homeomorphisms or just... It's a homeomorphism, yes, yes. 
So it's, it's a completely explicit description of the Bauman spectrum. So this is this is really a theorem that um, um, I proved with John Carson and Jeremy Rickard back in the nineties. And I think while I'm at it, since I only have a few minutes left, I'll state the the bigger theorem. So, um, do you all know what a localizing subcategory is? You're all nodding. Good. So the localizing subcategory is the tensor ideal. Thank you. Localizing subcategories. Localizing subcategories of the big stable module category. Are in bijection with um, all subsets of Proj H star GK again via either support or high support. And that is a theorem I proved with Henning and with Strickland Iyengar quite a bit later, about 15 years ago, maybe? Thereabouts. And I think that might be a good point to stop and ask questions for today because uh, 